This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 168 of the Dressage Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network. We would love if you would support our sponsors. Today's show is sponsored by Equestrian Collections, Draper Therapies, Fleece Works, and Kentucky Performance Products. This is Reese Coppler Stanfield from Georgetown, Kentucky. And this is Philip Parks from Fergus, Ontario, and you're listening to the Dressage Radio. And today we have Glenn producing. Hey guys, hey Philip, I'm so glad you're back because I had to co-host last week, and nobody wants me co-hosting this show. So <laughs> I am so well, happy. Glenn, I'm glad to be back. <laughs> we missed you, Philip, but Glenn, you did a great job uh-huh. on the Olympic show. Uh huh. Yeah, I hear you. And then <laughs> Reese, you were at the beach. Did you get all sunburnt? Are you like bright red like a lobster? Well, as everybody knows, last week I, I got like, the flu on vacation. That's see, this is what I get for going on vacation, uh, and and I apologize. I still my voice is still recovering, uh, but we had a great time and it was fun. Uh, I don't have a two year old, but it was fun spending a week with my nephew and sending. I adore him, but I was happy to send him home with his parents. It's one of the advantages of not having kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I enjoyed it, and I came home to all my four-legged, all my four-legged kids, and and I just loved coming home, and they were all happy to see me. So that's always a nice, a nice thing. And Philip, how was your horse show? Horse show was good. I ended up uh, reserve champion training level and reserve champion second level. So it was worth the effort. We had terrible weather. It rained the entire time. I got wet every single day. So uh, I'm at least happy to have some ribbons to come home with. You know. No doubt, no doubt. So, Philip, and, and Glenn doesn't even know, but Philip, you had a really big weekend besides the horse show. You got married? Well, yeah, well, no, I didn't get married, but I got I got engaged but before the horse show, not during it. You know, that's a little you bit. You did? You try and separate the things a little bit. But, uh, yeah, I've been uh, dating my fiance Meredith, for quite a while, and uh, we finally decided that we're going to try and set a date next year, probably, so... Are you are you willing to tell us how you did it? By the way, congratulations. I know. I, 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 I want to know. Worry, did you get ladies. down on I'm your gonna knee? I'm going to make him tell us how he yeah, did it. Have to do it. <laughs> no, no, I, I did no. it. I did it properly, you know, on one Can we put this on the radio, the, the, by the way, the before you stuff, say? You know, it, was, uh, <laughs> it was romantic. Don't worry. Oh, I hope so. Actually, Meredith is, is a wonderful lady, and I'm so excited for you both. She's lots of fun. And, uh, Philip, you are so smart because Meredith is an equine vet. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, that's, that's definitely helpful that's, around the barn. Well, now I mean, we that's know not the, the only story. reason. Let's not put it to that. She's great. <laughs> oh, no, but, no, no. Uh, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> but, yeah, it's very handy, and we have lots in common because of the horses, and, and she rides. And, uh, and uh, yeah, All right, great. but I have a question. I'm really looking does forward the, to it. Does the discount for a boyfriend go up when you become a fiancé? I, I think so, but we have to talk about it, I guess. <laughs> I hope so, and then I hope it goes up again when you get married. That's all I got to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's look at look somewhere in the hundred percent range. We'll, we'll we'll look for that. <laughs> Congratulations, I hope Philip. So. Yeah. I hope the uh, the friend advice for you know for me when I call, I would I would love the friend advice to go up to friend co host. Okay. Like I, I hope it I hope it goes up for me too. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> but Meredith is great. We're so excited, and um, Travis and I can't wait to come to Canada. I'm just inviting ourselves, but, but <laughs> yeah. don't worry, Reese. Don't worry, Reese. You're invited. <laughs> we have a good time, so uh, yeah, it'll be awesome. No, it's going to be great. We we really look forward to it. So congratulations from everybody here at the Horse Radio Network, and and I knew, but Glenn didn't, so uh, I kept it kept it a little bit of a secret for you. And that's not easy for Reese to do. I know. <laughs> I, trust me, I was like, nope, you got to find out on the show, Glenn. Sorry. Uh, there you go. <laughs> well, now oh, you really? know what we're going to have to do, Reese. The next time Phillip's out and away at a horse show, we're going to have to get Meredith the co host. <laughs> we'll see great. about that. Would, <laughs> I'll ask her. That, she would do a great job. She would be fabulous. So, yes, we, we, we'll kick him off for another week. I think that sounds great. Oh, that would be fun. Yeah, I would love for her to do that. Well, so, what other news have we got? Yeah, so we have lots of news um, uh, this week, actually. There's a lot going on. Um, I think we're all coming off the Olympic fever. I personally really miss the TV, uh, the Olympics, you know, on the, on TV. But um, I think it was, it was a great week last week. But um, one of the things that, that's come up is uh, the Council of the Village of Wellington on Wednesday approved a six-month of dressage, uh, 100 jumper shows, 
on the adjoining grass derby field from November 1st, uh, 2012 to April 30th. So at the multi-million dollar global dressage festival grounds that are part of the Palm Beach International Equestrian Center. So the vote was four to zero in favor of the global dressage uh, festival. Well, it's good because really... it solidifies that there's going to be, a, you know, that there's going to be a show season down there with all these great shows and the prize money and just, you know, just growing the scene down there, you know, one step further every year. I think is awesome. So. Yeah, no, it's great. And and they said on, in the article that the prize money is over six million dollars. Uh, so I think all of us, uh, that's that's so fabulous and and. I hope uh, to have a big tour horse again soon so that I can p- take part in that. What a, what a contentious argument they had. That thing has been going back and forth with, with the council there. They, they, I think they've had the longest council meetings ever in Wellington just over dressage and, and, and the festival. Well, dressage is very important, so I'm glad that they're spending <laughs> some time on it. I don't think it was all good there, Philip. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, it is. But I'm excited. I mean, but really, at the end of the day, those of us who have been to Wellington, uh, you know, the horses is a big deal there. And, and I think they were smart to, to go ahead and, and approve it. Um, but I'm happy for, for everybody down there. They've been working really hard on it. Um, and it's, it's a good thing for dressage, for sure. I guess what's next? We have some Totalist news. I mean, everybody wants to hear everything that's, that's going on with Totalist. And so now um, his rider has taken him uh, to go into full-time training with Chef Jensen. Um, he's known as the Dutch team trainer, Anki van Grunsven's trainer. Um, so it's a little bit news because, you know, it's a German rider going to a Dutch trainer for help. I mean, that's, uh, it's, never, it's not no, a normal thing to have happen. No, it isn't. I, I think we're all kind of uh, waiting with bated breath to see what happens with this horse. Um, you know, he didn't go to the Olympics because uh, Matias was ill and he had mono. And, and mono is, you know, I do know I've had some friends that have had it and, and you cannot ride with it. It's a dangerous thing. Um, but, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, what happens. I, I don't know about you, but my first thought is, uh oh, something's, something's not right with him. Well, I mean, I, we've seen him in a few shows. It seems like he's been, you know, in his training up and down a little bit. You know, it's been going really good to not quite as good. And so, and now they're seeking help from a different trainer. So it just says, you know, maybe they'd like to, uh, he's got some things to improve on and they're, they're looking for help with that. Yeah. I mean, I think we all do. And, and I think, you know, changing trainers is, uh, we've all been there, I think, and and it's time to you know sometimes it's not working, and you do need to make an adjustment. So uh, I wish him all the best. I think all of us want to see Totalist back and and see him back in his glory. And I hope Matthias, uh, you know, gets everything organized. So after the Olympics, we've seen uh, the World Dressage Rankings uh, with some changes in it. I guess with uh, a big show like that, this can happen. Adeline Cornelison and, and Parcival remain on top uh, of the standings, while Charlotte Desjardins and Vallegro, who won two gold medals after uh, the, uh, at the Olympics, um, have moved from uh, moved to second place from fourth place. Christina Sprea, uh, the 26-year-old uh, German rider who rode Desperado, moved uh, up to fifth place from 11th, and Victoria Max Thayer and Augustine. Um, old, uh, who rode as an individual for Austria, uh, were elevated to eighth place from 12th place. So there has been some moving around a little bit. Yeah, well, a couple of these horses were a little bit new to the ring. So, um, you know, just entering them in some shows previous to the Olympics and then the Olympics will just make the, the rankings change like that. You know, horses jumping up and down. I think, you know, the biggest news is the 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 offering of Vallegro and Utopia um, for sale by their by their owners. Uh, Carl Hester owns a big part of both of these horses, and um, he said that this was his plan all along. You know, for the horses to go to the Olympics to hopefully do well, and then uh, and then for him to, and then to cash sell them. in for big bucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, that's kind of the way to do it, I guess. Huh? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean they have the reserve on this. I just saw this on Yahoo Sports on Eurosport dot com, and we're talking twenty million bucks as a reserve. Mm-hmm. That twenty million actually. It's more than that because it's twenty million. Uh, is it euros or? I thought it was twenty million pounds. Oh, pound. Okay. I think it's twenty million pounds. That's um, about twelve I, million dollars, and you know, or, or about twelve billion dollars in U.S. So. 
Yeah, yeah that's that's a lot. And, and, and you know, I mean, I'm I I I wish I could be Carl Hester. Or I work every day to be Carl Hester. You know, he he bought those horses young. He trained them. Uh, they're beautifully trained horses. Uh, they both rode them, you know, incredibly well. Did incredibly well at the Olympics. And uh, you know, I mean, that's. Uh, you know, Philip and I, we get up every day as trainers and all the trainers around. You know, I hope I have a young horse. I can tell like that at the end of the day. Uh, well, so you know, I, the problem is if you don't have a huge, you know, sponsor being able to buy horses for you, then once they become, you know, certainly, you know, valuable, it's very tempting to uh, to sell them. I mean, you know, how many more horses can you buy with, with that kind of money to try and train and, and, and do again, right? I mean... And well, how yeah. quickly they become invaluable when they when mm-hmm. they come up lame, you know? Oh well, it just comes. Oh, yeah, it yeah. takes a split yeah. thing, you know, just a, a small tendon thing or whatever, and then you know, then where you know, where is all all the money goes? This article so. does go on to say that the uh, no big surprise that the Arabian royals are uh, taking a look and and are maybe interested. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, you know, again, I hope Carl buys a great house or a great, you know, yacht somewhere because he deserves it and uh, good for him. And I hope more of more people can do it. So uh, I wish them all well for sure. Yeah, I guess that means that uh, Great Britain will be looking for, you know, new new horses or new new combinations for the world, you know, the world championships or, or the next Olympics. Right. I mean. Yeah, they're going to have to rebuild their whole string, aren't they? Um, and, you know, hopefully they have – hopefully Carl has a, a barn full. If not, he will too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, <laughs> I got to so tell hopefully. you a funny thing about this article at the end. At the very end, it says uh, it's all about the, these British horses and how they did at the Olympics and all that. And the last paragraph, they threw in Rafalco, a horse owned by Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney's wife and was part of the United States team that finished fourth. That was yeah, just a little thing. Just you know, had to throw, throw it in at the yeah, end of this gotta, article gotta about have, the British horses. Nowhere does it talk about American horses, and then they throw that one in. <laughs> they just can't let it go. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, goodness. So in other news, last week there was also uh, the World Young Dressage Horse Championships in Verdun. So, Philip, tell us a little bit about what happened there. Well, um, in the five-year-old class was won by a horse named Sakur, and this is a Sir Donner Hall Don Daffodoff um, horse, and ridden by Ava Mola. Now, she's got lots of championships, um, you know, from the young horse and from Bundes Championat, and, and so we're always looking for, you know, what horses she's riding uh, for the year, and, and I think that was a really good one. And then the six-year-olds was run, won by um, Woodlander Farouche, and that's uh, a chestnut mare owned... Yeah, by um, some English riders, actually. So it's another exciting horse coming from England. Maybe that'll be a good one for Rio de Janeiro. Um, this is a first Heinrich DiMaggio horse. It won the five-year-old World Young Horse Young Championships. And this year, year it won with a score of 9.88, which is pretty much perfect. 10 is, 10 is perfect. And they, and they rate the walk, the trot, the canter, um, the rideability of the horse and the overall impression, and uh, uh, this is a champion. If you get a chance to look on YouTube, this horse it uh, it's it's a fabulous horse to watch go. So I, you know, I really like the young horse championships. I really like to watch the young horses. Um, a lot of people like the breeders are really interested in it because there's a lot of stallions in this show, and uh, it shows you know good combinations of sires and and dams and. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's it's super interesting anyways. And you get to see some of the horses that um, will end up in the Grand Prix ring and end up representing teams uh, like Damon Hill, which was a uh, – he, he placed in the Young Horse Championships if he didn't win it. I don't know the, the exact placings uh, from those years ago. Yeah, I don't either. But, you know, I agree. It's, it's really wonderful to watch the young horses and, and see how they're presented in Europe. And it's really – it's definitely worth the YouTube look at, at, at that mare because she is phenomenal. Um, so uh, – but we are, another kind of Olympic thing, uh, there's some criticism of the Olympic format. Um, and the Canadian, Danish, uh, the Netherlands, the United States – are all really critical of the three member team. Um, and that was forced, that was, you know, forced uh, in the London games as it was in the Beijing games. Um, Canada, as we know, David Marcus had a real hard time and, and had a horse spook 
um, and had to be excused. Uh, they fell victim of this no drop score, um, which was it eliminated the entire uh, team. And and these are horses, so uh, drop scores are, are a good thing because things happen. Um, and well, also, you know, it just doesn't seem fair between the the jumpers who get a drop score, the eventers that get two drop scores, and then and then the dressage riders don't don't get one. Like it's just. You know, this doesn't make sense to to a lot of people, um, you know, in our sport. So I think this, this, you know, there should be a lot of pressure for this for this to change and for the teams to get four riders. Why did they do it? I, I don't know why they did it in the first place. They're trying to limit the number. I mean, as far as I understand, they're trying to limit the number of horses that go to the games to 200. And so this so is a way to So got that. picked on? <laughs> so we got picked on. Yeah, even though basically. we sold out yeah. the stands, there's huge crowds. To uh, you know, every one of the dressage tests, and uh, and yeah, somehow we we get the bum end of the deal. Yeah, and they also got the bum end of the deal this time. There's a gap of four days between the Grand Prix and the Grand, uh, you know, the Grand Prix special, um, and that was a big deal because you know, again, fans have to stay, they have to um, stay in hotels, they have to you know, they eat out, uh, all kinds of things. So it really is is a difficult problem. To also uh, have the the Grand Prix go, and then wait several days before the Grand Prix and uh, special and the freestyle. So, I, I hope they work some of this stuff out to make it a little bit more uh, friendly for the crowd, but also for the horses. I mean, that's a long time just kind of be in those those barns and in the in the tent in the sta- secured stabling. It's that's tough on them. Well, it's tough to get your horse to peak at the right moment, right, with the right kind of energy and the right day, and then you're going to wait for four days trying to keep the horse kind of you know at top performance it, it yeah again it's another thing that doesn't really make sense it's not horse friendly it's not rider friendly and it's not spectator friendly so you know I, I can see where all these criticisms are coming from yeah i do too agreed and it's it's very very challenging um and and i understand you know when you go to an international competition all these riders uh, have been there before and and can are used to you know having to share ring space and and that type of thing. But this is pretty extreme, so I hope they are able to work it out and and fix it. Yeah, I agree. And then um, coming up, I guess we have the U.S. Young Dressage Horse uh, Championships. Is that next week? I think twenty third through the twenty fifth. Yeah, that's next week. So next. Oh, sorry, twenty fifth you know, to the twenty eighth. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. So we're really going to we're looking forward next week. We'll have some of the riders on. Uh, Philip and I are friends with a bunch of the, the riders that are going. Uh, so we're looking forward to hearing about how they're preparing there. We'll try and get a four five and a six year old rider on next week uh, to talk about uh, how they've prepared their horses and, and what they're going to do with the trip and that type of thing. So look, that's going to be fun for next week. Yeah, I think this is a, this is a, another fun young horse show. It's always exciting. And and you know you never know what they're going to do so i you know i really enjoy watching these types of shows and uh and uh you know like you said we have some friends that are that are going to be showing there um so looking forward to that but what do we got this week Reese? so this week um we have Laura Knowles uh she is a international rider and trainer and we also have Ellen Wall and Ellen is a rider that has trained her horse uh from he is 12 now. She bought him as a five-year-old and has gone through the levels with him. So she's got some great insight to kind of start talking about our young horse a uh, couple weeks. We, we wanted to dedicate the next few weeks to training young horses. We all have, have them or have friends that have them. Uh, so it should be a really fun uh, couple weeks. And, and the show, uh, Ellen gives great insight on what it was like to, to do that with her horse. Well, it'll be nice hearing from an amateur and their perspective. I mean, I've trained a lot of young horses and brought them along, and you have too. But, you know, what is somebody in their first, uh, first experience going, you know, from 5-year-old to 12-year-old? How, how does that go? I'm, I'm, I'm curious anyways. We'll get to Ellen Wall's interview right after this commercial from Equestrian Collection. Hi, Glenn the Geek here, and I'm back with Debbie from Equestrian Collections with the Equestrian Collections Product of the Week. This week, I'm going to feature something that has to do with the fact that we have had the hottest summer ever. People are clipping their horse. People are worried about sunburn on their little white noses, and they're worried about color change because of the sun. 
The Healthy Hair Care Sunflower Sunscreen for Horses is a product that I have used on my horse when I clip him in the spring or early summer, and I know a lot of people clip more than once during the summer. All you do is spray this stuff on, and it will keep them from being sunburned with their exposed skin after you clip them, no matter how careful you are to clip you're always going to get some a little bit too short um, also you can take it and I can you can put it on a sponge and put it on their face if they've got a white face or if they've got a white nose that you're worried about you can spray it on a sponge and put that on their face and it will protect their white faces and um, the the manufacturers say it will help keep the coats the same color I know that's a concern if you're in a place that's really just so hot to cover them up with a fly sheet you can try this and see if that doesn't help. My horse is black and white, and I will tell you that the black does stay black. I would suggest trying this for that, but I would definitely recommend trying this for a sunburn after clipping or when you're trying to keep them from getting a sunburn on their little white noses. And you can find the Healthy Hair Care Sunflower Sunscreen for Horses, there's a name for you, for $17, a little over $17 at equestriancollections.com. And I'm assuming the bottle lasts a while. It looks like a pretty good size. It does. It's a quart. It, um, it lasts a while. It will probably last you through a couple of clippings and plenty of just if you're just putting it on their little faces and their noses. All right, just go on to equestriancollections.com and search for Healthy Hair Care Sunflower, or just search for Sunflower, and you'll find it. I'd like to welcome Ellen Wall, a junior at the University of Georgia. She's here to talk to us uh, about her horse, Tavari, or TiVo. He's a 12-year-old Dutch warm blood gelding by Fleming. And um, I actually know this horse. Uh, I trained him uh, from the time he was uh, like late three-year-old to early four-year-old. Uh, and then the horse was uh, sent to be sold uh, by the owner. And um, he was bought by Ellen about a year later. Um, so I know that we, we met up at a horse show in Wellington. I was walking down the barn aisle and saw him. And uh, she, Ellen came to the University of Kentucky for two years. So uh, I have some history with this horse. And I've known Ellen for several years. And I'm looking forward to hearing about her journey with this horse because this has uh, been a challenging horse uh, to train and to work with. Ellen, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. We're, we're excited to have you, and we wanted to start the conversation right away. Tell us a, a little bit about Tavari, uh, TiVo, and, um, you know, kind of your challenges with training him. You got him when he was five, and he's 12 now. So talk to us a little bit about the challenges that you've faced over the years with him. Well, um, I got him when, I was five, uh, when he was five, and I was 14, so I was still learning a lot as well as he was too when i first got him um he had kind of been thrown on like a bunch of third he was quote unquote third level uh but he was not trained correctly with the basics so i have constantly have always worked really hard with uh just constant having to focus on basics and uh we started off i ended in the first level um we did really well in first then second and then third and then we did juniors um it was he was so great uh we probably had like an average of like our like mid 60s um and then this past i took about a year off in this past year uh we tried for young riders and um he's being he's great but we do face a lot of trouble we have a lot of troubles with a lot of some of the basic stuff and then like just getting him really through and having him sit with the pirouettes has been definitely a challenge uh that we have faced but we're working on it every single day to make it better. So uh, just then, describe a little bit, you know, in the beginning, you know, what were you doing? You know, how did your coach help you? Just maybe the first year or two years, you know, just getting yeah, over that, um, that beginning hump. What were, the, what were the exercises you were doing, the ones that were giving you a hard time and maybe how you got through it a little bit? Yeah. Um, when we first, when I first got him, we had to go back and completely – reteach uh flying changes and like rainbacks and um some of the things we did were just like for the flying changes we would make like go across you know like a quarter of the diagonals we had like the wall to go in front of um because he tends to leap sideways like when he'd been first taught to do changes he would leap sideways 
Um, so we would have to do it like right next to a wall to teach him to uh, like stay straight. And we just basically had to go back and have refocused on a lot of the basic movements, um, which is why it was even though he was quote unquote a third level horse, we started off at doing training level also because I was I mean not training first level also because I was still learning. Um, but I always rode him in the snaffle and never moved into the double bridle until he was completely ready until I went to third level. Um, but I think it was really important and great that I spent so many, um, years just working in the snaffle and getting him really, truly connected, even though he was, uh, labeled as a third level horse solid in the double bridle and everything. So Ellen, talk a little bit about the throughness. I mean, he has some conformational challenges. Um, you know, what are some things that you do on a daily basis that help you with, with kind of increasing your, or getting your throughness to be better? Well, for him, yeah, it's definitely, he's kind of built a little long in the back. Um, and it's really hard for him, confirmation wise, to like sit down and really come through behind. And sometimes, even though draw reins are a lot of people kind of disagree with them. Um, if I think if they're used in the correct way, uh, I have put them on him to help him just really bring his neck, get his neck lower. So he doesn't, he tends to arch his back, um, or drop his back and keep his hind legs out instead of coming underneath himself. And I have found that draw reins have really helped uh, me strengthen his hind end so that he can really get that collection and keep that throughness through all the movements. That's yeah, good. I think draw reins, yeah, I think, you know, draw reins are, are, are for sure, I think Philip will jump in with his opinion, but I think draw reins uh, can be a very helpful tool, and, and just like anything in the horse world, it's a tool, and um, something that, it, when they're used appropriately, uh, can be really helpful, um, and, and I know TiVo quite well, and he is a very, very challenging horse to get through, you know, once he right. gets it, and and you know he he can be very challenging. So uh, and he's a big horse. He's uh, he's over 17 hands. Um, so it can help. And you're you're tall and you're strong, but you don't always want to ride that way. Um, so right. I think the draw reins when used appropriately. It also, are, helps, it also helps to keep me light in my hands as well, so that I'm not fighting with him. Because I'll find a lot of times when I'm you know when I'm asking for the collection and asking him to really sit in his hind end. I mean. It's natural for most horses who struggle with that to really get fussy in the bridle or to just really lean against your hands. And the drawings kind of help me from prevent me from fighting with him or, you know, moving his head around too much and really just losing the actual true connection. And um, things like working with the drawings, doing things like the pirouettes or even just for um, some basic movements, just like the smaller circles and just getting him to really come back and sit on his hind end. Um, I have found that it really helps me a lot. Yeah, I mean, as far as draw reins go, for me on, you know, 90% of horses, I'm not I'm not going to use them. Not that I def- definitely disagree with them, but I, I just don't feel like I, I need them. But for some of my students, you know, you're only riding one horse a day or you're not that advanced with your with your own riding. It's just a little bit of a tool to to help you get over an issue or help you with an issue and then take them away. I think, you know, draw reins get right. get a little bit problematic when you always use them or, you know, when you're leaning on them for as as a bit of a crutch. I think use them to help the rider or help the horse a little bit and then take them away and see what happens, right? And then try and train through it through it yourself. It's kind of a way of yeah. of leading the horse or leading the rider to the right answer. And then, you know, I, I see it sometimes it just clicks for, for that combination and then they're not needing it. You can put them away and put them, you know, back in storage or whatever. But just, you know, here and there, I think it can be a very, a very useful tool in training horses and training and training people to, you know, to get the right contact or, you know, just as a, a little bit of a help here or there, not as an answer to all questions or, or anything like that. Oh, completely. And then another thing, too, that has helped with our, like, does she help him keep, you know, sitting on his haunches and everything too. Um, Reese and I, we, I, we always worked, um, I did a lot of hill work of like going, um, just walking up uh, like any kind of large hill just to keep, like, get his hind end strong. Cause I really have, a, I think a lot of his problems come from that, that his hind end really just isn't, it's, he just kind of is weak in his hind end. It's hard to like keep his, uh, muscles. 
um, and just keep his strength. And so I do a lot of like before, like when I'm just walking before and after my rides, you know, to warm up or cool him off. I do a lot of hill work just to keep, to start getting up his uh, hind end uh, more built. Yeah, I think you see, you see a lot of people recommend hill work. It's, you know, hopefully you have a few hills around, you know, in some areas maybe it's not useful. But I think hill work and pole work do a little bit the, the same sort of thing, right? The, mm-hmm. I mean, do you use any of that? The the pole? Yeah, poles or, or cavalettis or things like that. Oh, poles. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> That's actually, I do um, sometimes, I don't do it very often, but... Um, I'll even, like, we do a lot of pull just to keep, um, you know, like, he also is not very organized with his legs, too, sometimes. And, like, the poles really help him with that. And then I also will sometimes just jump him over little X's just, like, and really focus on getting him to come back and sit before the jump because it makes him have to actually lift himself up with his hind legs. Um, and I found that actually helps, too, sometimes. But not, I know that's not for all horses, but for me, that does help. And Ellen, what are some other challenges? I mean, this was your first year, um, which you won your silver medal, which was is such an achievement, and especially on such a, a challenging horse. This this horse, um, you know, I know him really well, and he also is is hard in in the barn. He's he's a, he's a challenging horse, um, right? You know, this was your first year at Pre St. George, yours and his. What was the difference between uh, you had a great uh, third and fourth level, well, really third level career. You just did your first fourth level this year. What would you talk about kind of the the hills and, and challenges you had to, to overcome going into the, you know, FBI ring? There, were, It was a huge difference just between going from juniors to the young riders you know, doing the Pre St. George was it was like really shocking to me how different it was. Just how, um, especially when I, because I was, you know, a young rider, I didn't have as much as experience as a lot of people out there, and it was just the how you have to like really go from letter to letter and like use your corners and just you can't you can't like have any moments where you aren't really focusing on every single movement because also the movements are so much faster than they are in the lower levels. Um, cause once you're done with another one, you have to be immediately preparing for the next one. And that was really just challenging for me just to have to focus like that and to have, you know, TiVo focusing on me too, and being able to be that agile to turn this way and then do a movement and immediately you're starting another one. It was, um, definitely very challenging. And I definitely think that it takes experience in the arena at those levels to really be able to master them um a lot of it too i for just personally a lot of the troubles we had too where his neck would get really high because it was so like fast and so everything was just the movements were so fast that his neck would get really high and um the judges did comment on that quite a bit and just had really focused on getting keeping his neck low and in those upper level movements it was definitely harder. Now, Alan, looking back on, you know, the few years that you've you've spent with this horse, would you recommend buying a young horse and, and training training it, you know, a little bit yourself with a, with a lot of help? Would, was there some some mistakes maybe you made that that people should avoid or, or you know, how did it go? What what's your what's your thoughts on it? When I got him, um, when I was 14, like like I said, I was still learning. I had been riding my um, old trainers Grand Prix horse for a little while. He was very challenging Grand Prix horse, but I had been riding him. However, I still didn't have a lot of experience. And I, it helps that I had my trainer there to help me teach Tivo all of this stuff. And I couldn't have done it, you know, just by myself. There's no way I could have done it by myself. But because I did get him when I was 14 and still learning, I, he has bad habits that I have just put on him because I didn't know. And um, I would have definitely wished I had been more solid in my basics when I had been teaching him all this because as a young horse he was learning you know everything that I was doing and there's a lot of things that like he's kind of dulled the leg because my legs used to be I used to not be able to control my legs as well and he's kind of dulled the leg now and that's because I wasn't experienced when I was training him when he was younger and I think it's great to train a horse when they're younger, but I think you have to make sure that you're solid in your basics uh, to be able to do it. 
And Ellen, if you were, you know, to do this again, or when you do this again and start with another young horse, what are some things that you will look for that maybe are different than, than TiVo? I would probably look for a horse that's a little shorter in the back. Um, it's been really challenging that he's kind of has such a long, he's gorgeous and very free in his movement, but because he is so long, having to really put him together can sometimes be really challenging. Um, and then also he has, like I said, the beautiful free movement, but he doesn't have much really suspension in his movement and it's great for the lower levels. But when you get into the upper levels, it's, it gets a lot harder just because he doesn't have that natural suspension. And so what would, what would you say when, you know, if you were to advise or when you go with clients to look for other horses, young horses, what are some things that you like to look for? <laughs> the first thing always rideability, you know, I mean, confirmation and these things, I mean, it depends on, you know, for the client, what their goal is. I mean, if their goal is Grand Prix, you know, we, we have to be a little bit more discerning about the movement of the horse and the confirmation of the horse. But I think most people, you know, they, when we're looking for a horse, it's all about rideability and, and maybe not about, you know, the end goal of, of how high the horse goes, but how easy it is every day to kind of get on and, and to teach it things. I think confirmation goes, you know, so far in making the movements easy for the horse, but the, the brain of the horse is just so important. So, you know, when I'm trying horses... You know, I'm going to get on, I'm going to challenge the horse a little bit and just see how mentally, you know, they can, they deal with it or, you know, take them out, ride them around a little bit. Because I think in the end, it's just you have to enjoy the horse and, and enjoy the day to day work. You know, if it's if it's not your job, I mean, for me, it's my job to kind of fix a lot of horses or, or get through a lot of problems. But not everybody wants to go through that every day. So it's yeah, it's all about the brain. And, you know, what do you think, Reese? Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, you know, like I said, uh, Tivo has been a challenging horse. I I, I um, rode that that horse actually before Ellen Bottom. We didn't know each other, and and we met each other when she came to university here for a few years. Um, and he was always a challenging horse. Um, he was tough in the barn, and he was tough uh, with men. He was uh, he had something happen when he was really young. Um, and I think that's really important when you look for young horses is, um, rideability, but also how they've been handled, uh, sort of, do they come with any baggage? I think that's right. really important and something, um, you know, that, that you'll work with, but I, I completely agree, Philip, you know, when I look for a horse for a client, I always say, I want to be able to ride that horse, um, when, you know, that client's on vacation, I want to enjoy that horse as much, uh, getting the horse out and working with them. Uh, as, as anything else. So I think you always have to think of that. And, and like Ellen was saying, it's not always the big fancy movement that you should be looking for. I mean, that's, that's a piece of the puzzle, but certainly not something that, that you want to always go for. So rideability, I would agree. And just, you know, do you click with that horse? Is that a horse's personality? Um, is, is also very, very important. So, Ellen, tell us a little bit now about what your plans are for TiVo. He's 12. Uh, I know uh, that, that you don't really want to sell him. Uh, you want to keep him forever. Kind of what are your plans in the next few years with him? Well, um, I think now I'm kind of I'm really focusing on uh, doing the pre-St. George this year. I'm um, considering I'm back in Georgia. Right now I was in Kentucky, uh, but now I'm back at UGA cause, or University of Georgia for a scholarship. And I have him here with me, and I think that I'm going to work on um, doing regionals at fourth level since I am currently qualified for that. And then maybe for the next year, uh, work on doing some pre-St. George and really cleaning up those tests and hopefully giving, making him a solid pre-St. George horse. And so far, those are that's my plans right now, and we'll see what goes on from there. Oh, I think that's great. I think that's really, really fabulous. So we wish you all the best luck. Thanks for coming on and, and talk to, talking to everyone about your challenges and, and also your success with him. Congratulations, and um, you're a spotlight rider for all of us. Thank you so much. It was great to talk to all of you. Well, guys, have you guys ever came across the fleece work pads? Love so, them. I'll I tell you what. 
these are the nicest pads. She actually, we, 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 met, uh, we met Judy from Fleece Works several years ago at the uh, trade show, at the wholesale sh- and retail show that we go to every year at the Horse Radio Network, and we record from there. And she's always set up right across from us. Okay. And she was so nice. They gave us the hardest damn chairs to sit on to record for three days. <laughs> and, and, then, and she gave you a She pad. did. She brought over these fleece, awesome. these big fleeces that fit on the chairs, and they were perfect. Oh. And then when we left, she let them take us home with take take oh. them home. And that's what I sit on. So I'm actually sitting on one of those soft, super soft fleece pads. These are the nicest pads, and they have they have shape pads for dressage. They have square pads for dressage. The 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 balance technology they use in these is incredible. The fleece is the best uh, merino sheepskin that you can get from Australia. They are just super nice, heavy duty, durable pads. And I don't know, Reese, if you agree with that, but I, I just love these pads. Everybody that I know loves these pads. That has I do too. Um, I use them. I use them on my young horse. Do you? I, use, I I just got off of one two hours ago. Love them. Love them. They they just help, uh, especially with my young one. His saddle, you know, he's just in a weird growing stage, and his saddle just not right. And and you put that bad boy under there, and it's great. So I use it on a daily basis and love them. One of the other things <laughs> about these pads is that they last a long time. They are yeah. quality. They're good stuff, and they last a long time. You can check them out at fleeceworks dot com. And you can go on there. She has them all broken down many different ways. But if you take a look at whether you're looking for shape pad or square pad or whatever you're looking for, she has them broken down into dressage. So you can find the dressage pads in there. They're affordable and they're very, very good quality. So, so that's fleece works for, for, for your saddle pad needs. Next, we have Laura Noyes, who um, has some trainer tips based on young horses for us. She's a Draper-sponsored rider, so she's going to talk a little bit about the Draper Therapies great products, and um, she's an up-and-coming rider. Laura, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on tonight. Hey. Well, we're looking forward. We're, we're having a young horse theme tonight, and you have a fabulous trainer tip for us on how to work with young horses. Yes, there are three kind of major things that I try to balance and and think about when training a young horse. Um, The first is patience. You know, that goes without saying in training any horse, really. Um, The second is developing the horse's work ethic. Um, And the third is kind of quitting while you're ahead. So the last two can be somewhat contradictory. um, But I think the balance of all of those three things are, are what are really important. I like the the idea of having uh, you know a lot of patience. Uh, maybe you want to go into a little bit more detail about your about your second and and third tip and explain how you use it from you know day to day and and what you mean by those things. Sure. Um, so the last two things they, they are very connected, and I think it's really important to establish a good work ethic at a young age. You know, I see a lot of horses kind of later on that they go out and. They do their 30 minutes, and then they kind of check out. Um, and, of course, fitness and, and strength play a large role in this. But I think it's important that there's a level of consistency, you know, where a horse expects that five or six days a week they will either be ridden or, or lunged or hacked or something. So, you know, the horse doesn't necessarily have to be very hard or extremely strenuous, but they expect that they'll do something in their day. And hopefully, you know, the goal is we can – get them to look forward to doing something and they're not just hanging out in your stall. Um, so, and, and of course, you know, people go on vacation in order to get time off and that's expected and that's a reality. And sometimes it works out well that that's a really good break for horses. However, I think, you know, the main thing with developing a work ethic is just trying to stay consistent um, for the most part. And then the last thing, you know, quitting while you're ahead you know, it's a little bit contradictory, like I said, with developing work ethic. Um, but I think it's really important with young ones to, to end on a good note. And, you know, everyone should be able to get off after the ride and, you know, feel free to give the horses lots of praise and treats and make it a really positive thing. Um, and, you know, of course, at the end of the session, a young horse is going to tire quickly. And that would not be the time I would choose to, to work on something like counter canner or something that, is difficult for the horse anyways. You know, when a horse is tired, that's when the horse can become really unfun and unfortunately create some sour horses. Um, so some days, if I can, you know, get on and accomplish 
everything I had planned to or, or wanted to in 20 minutes, you know, I'm going hack on the property and, and call it a day. Um, I think it's especially important to do this on days when you get and great and focused and, and really make your short positive session. Sometimes you're really tempted when a horse feels awesome to ride, ride, ride and, and get everything you can out of them. We get a little greasy sometimes. That's necessary too. You know, we have to be able to push them and, and see what they offer. But, you know, on the other hand, sometimes it's really nice to give them a super easy day. They're so good. And, and that way they don't come to present to work and, you know, mixing and things are, are so great for their minds. And it, of course, gives their muscles and bodies a chance to recover. So, Laura, one of the things, you know, developing work ethic, um, you know, you talked a little bit about uh, doing some other things. So mm -hmm. do you hack to, you know, do you take them outside? Do you work hills? Uh, do you free jump them? Uh, you know, are there some other things that you do to help develop work ethic um, as a young horse? Yeah, no, I think all that stuff is great. I don't have a ton of experience with free jumping or that, you know, sort of thing, but definitely hacking and, you know, working on hills and going through fields and into the woods and, just different things so that they get out and they see different things and they don't really realize they're working maybe. You know, it's a, you kind of them that way. But they're still, you know, getting their heart rates up and, and getting a little stronger and, and working that way. And talk a little bit about a plan for maybe a four-year-old, a five-year-old, and, and a six-year-old. You know, how long do you, do you tend to work them? Um, how many days a week works for you? And, and what kind of plan to develop a, a work ethic? Because I think, you know, you can't just hop on a four-year-old and go six days a week, you know, as far as, yeah, you know, I'm days. concerned. And, but, you know, you make sure that they get their work. So, you know, kind of talk about a little bit about, you, you know, your plan and, and getting them stronger and, and developing that. Yeah. Well, of course, with every horse, it, it so depends, which makes the sport um, but typically, you know, for a four-year-old, I'd like to go six days or five days. Um, maybe, you know, two days and then four days or three days and then a break in three days. Um, so, and, and basically, you know, the horse should be able to tell you, I think, at any level or at any age, you know, when is enough. And that's the trick, I think, it is really figuring out each horse how much they can offer and how much pressure they can take, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. And then, of course, you know, throughout the week. Um, so as a four-year-old, you know, I would probably plan to, to do roughly five days a week and, you know, vary the ride from 20 minutes to maybe one or two 40-minute sessions, you know, during the week. Not, you know, of course, off the break and not super hard work, but just so that they're working. Um, and then, you know, as a five-year-old, you increase that a little bit. Um, and hopefully by then, they're starting some louder work. And you can make it, you know, the work a little bit more interesting, a little bit more challenging. And then as a six-year-old, you know, if everything's kind of on track and maybe you're shooting for, you know, the yeah, six-year-old, I don't think it's great that more like, like a real board. You know, they work six days, definitely easy days and skin, but, you know, the level of work on a consistent basis is, is challenging. And they're, they're thinking and using their backs and their muscles and, and really working to get, you know, stronger. And, you know, hopefully by 7 and 8, they're, they're ready for the precinct George. So that's, of course, if all goes well. You know, every horse is different and progresses at a very different different rate and different speed. And to think that is what makes it so hard, there is no point loss, you know, with any with training. We have lots of different ideas and lots of different theories, but when it comes down to it, I think we really have to listen to the horse and see exactly what they tell us and, and let them, in a way, dictate you know, the speed at which we, we progress them. Um, but, you know, it's nice. You have to have some sort of plan and some sort of kind of goal to follow. Um, and that's what nice about being horse has. So, Laura, you are one of the sponsored riders for Draper Therapy, and they're one of our sponsors for the month. So I want you to talk a little bit about the products that you use from Draper. Uh, which ones are your favorite? Well, my favorite products are probably the saddle pads. Um, I've been with Draper for about five years now. I've had some saddle pads last me five years, and they're still going. You know, I, you can wash them over and over again, dry them over and over again. 
they hold up so well. Um, and then, of course, the therapeutic properties. You know, the horses come out a little bit softer in their backs, you know, the next day a little bit warmed up already. And um, so it's just such a great, well-made product that, that I'm very happy to be sponsored by. Excellent. Are there any other products that you enjoy using? I also have a few of the T-shirts. You know, they make um, some of the products as equine and dog products, so T-shirts, which are great. And I also have um, a mattress pad that goes under, you know, my sheets. And that helps a little, you know, after riding however many horses a day and doing however many horses, you know, stalls, wake up a little bit less, hopefully, and feeling a little bit better. Those are also great for, for human usage. I think those are products that all of our listeners uh, and, and myself and Philip, I'm sure we can use them. So, Laura, thank you for coming on the show and being a spokesperson for Draper. Well, that was great of Laura to join us today. I apologize for her sound there, but I'll tell you what. What she was trying to say is that the Draper Therapies products really do work. Uh, you know, I uh, the one thing I use religiously of theirs, Reese, and it got me through the World Equestrian Games. 16 days I was there for 12, 14 hours a day. Uh, was their socks. Their human socks are terrific. They really do what, you, you know, the, the, the magic dust that's in those products. That's what I call it, magic dust. The magic <laughs> dust, that's the fancy technical mm-hmm. term that, that they use over there. The magic dust is absolutely wonderful. My feet were killing me after three days there, and she gave me these socks. I was, I was complaining to her uh, at the, they were set up there. And she said, take these, wear them, and in two days you're going to come back and thank me. And I did. I, I wore them the whole rest of the time. I bought several more pairs so I wouldn't run out, and I wore them for the rest of the 16 days. And that kind, the Magic Dust really works on all their products and really does work for the horses, too. So it's products that are definitely worth taking out, uh, checking out at drapertherapies.com. Well, guys, before we continue on, we it's time this week for the Kentucky Performance Products Supplement Tip of the Week. And we're going for, to the opposite spectrum in this tip. And, of course, we started these last week where Karen for, from Kentucky Performance Products joins us to give us a little insight onto what supplements are correct for what horses so that you're not over-supplementing or, or you have a horse that might need something and what do you give them. And, and that's one of the hardest things because there's so many people talking about so many things. So we thought we'd we'd make this kind of educational on the shows. And today she's talking about the older horse, and I believe it's the older horse that's hard to keep weight on. So let's take a listen. Hi, Glenda Geek here from the Horse Radio Network, and I'm here with Karen from Kentucky Performance Products with a sensible supplementing tip of the week. Karen, this week we're talking about senior horses, and actually this is a two-parter. We're going to talk about senior horses this week that cannot keep weight on, have trouble maintaining weight, and next week we're going to talk about the ones who don't have any trouble keeping weight on. That'd be like me. Uh, I don't have any <laughs> trouble with that at all. So, so what do we? Uh, why do horses, especially seniors, have trouble maintaining weight? Well, you know, senior horses are horses that are, you know, 18 years of age or older, and that may change after a while because, you know, we're doing such a good job of keeping our horses healthy these days that they're just living longer and longer all the time. It used to be you never heard about a 30-year-old horse, and now it's becoming the norm. So it's really important that, you know, we have some ways to keep these horses going and, and as they get older so that they don't have to just all turn into pasture ornaments. Um, one of the big problems with an older horse um, that may be losing weight is they've, they've lost, they have a reduced ability to absorb nutrients from the diet. And that can be caused from, you know, a lifetime of exposure to parasites or just any kind of damaging event to the gastrointestinal tract. And even with the stringent deworming schedules and things we have, there, there usually still is some damage um, from parasites. So that's something that may cause a horse to stop losing weight. But also sometimes they'll have um, less of an, of an appetite, um, so you need to keep their appetite stimulated. Um, the first thing I want to say is if you have a horse that's losing weight, the first thing you need to do is get your vet involved and get your horse completely checked out make sure there isn't some underlying problem for them um, that could be fixed um, medically. And also you should have a dentist come and, and check your horse's teeth. We talk to a lot of people on the phone, and most people are really aware of having an equine dentist routinely, but there are some people that have never thought about it. So it's important to get their teeth checked um, 
Sometimes if you have a horse that's losing weight, it's just because they can't chew well enough. And if you get your equine dentist in and they fix those hooks and, and flatten out any spots where the teeth aren't coming together properly, that will that will solve your problem. Okay. So that's those are two of the main things you should look at right away, even before you start thinking about supplements. The second thing that you need to do is make sure that your horse is getting enough high-quality fiber. And again, a lot of people, you know, don't understand that a horse needs one and a half to two percent of their body weight a day in hay. And one percent of that should be in some kind of long-stemmed fiber, either hay or pasture. So if you have a a thousand-pound horse, that's 20 pounds of hay. So 10 pounds of that could be in in grass and 10 pounds of that could be in hay. Um, Well, it it wouldn't be 10 pounds in grass. It would be 10 pounds of grass equivalent of dry matter. So that would be a lot of grass. That would be half a day of grazing on on a really good pasture. But you want to be sure that they have plenty of good fiber. Um, that keeps their digestive tract healthy, and if and it keeps the microorganisms in their digestive tract healthy. And if the digestive tract tissues and microorganisms are healthy, then the horse will be able to absorb um, the maximum amount from their diet. So something that we always suggest for older horses, besides a, a hay and some kind of a concentrate, um, a good senior feed fed at the recommended level would be appropriate and, of course, electrolytes for senior horses. The other thing that you can do if you have a horse that's losing weight and you've had it checked and you know there's nothing medically wrong is to feed it a high-fat supplement. It has a lot more energy in it than your typical um, grains, cereal grains, almost two times as much, so that you can feed less in a meal and get more energy out of it, which is what you want to do when you have a horse that's that's, um, hard to keep weight on. You certainly don't want to throw so much grain at them that that grain um, causes grain overload, which can be very damaging to the hindgut and can cause colic and laminitis. So a high-fat product will allow you to feed less so you can keep your meals smaller, and it has more calories per pound so that you can get more energy into your horse. For example, Karen, what, what products would we be looking at? Well, we have, a, we have two different products that we have as high-fat products. One is Equijoule, which is a, a high-fat stabilized rice brand. And something that you want to think about when you're looking at a, a fat supplement is you want to turn around uh, and look at the guaranteed analysis and see how much fat is offered in that product. The Equijoule product is 20% fat, and you have to feed one to two pounds a day is the recommended dose. Um, it's it's a rice bran that is balanced for calcium and phosphorus, and rice bran typically uh, is high in phosphorus, and so you wouldn't want to feed it unless there was some kind of a calcium source added to it that balances that calcium and phosphorus ratio so that you don't have any mineral imbalances with it. So that's one that you can feed. Um, that would be for a horse that you just, you know, you, he was, kind of a hard keeper, you wanted to reduce the amount of grain and you wanted to, to give him um, just some nice, a nice fat supplement to add some extra energy. We have another uh, product called Endure Extra. Now this product is 50% fat. Oh wow. And you only have to feed 8 ounces a day. So this, this product is for your real picky eaters, um, for horses that you know you really need to put the weight on them. Um, this product has a lot of energy in it. It also has some added um, flax, so you're getting some omega threes in there, and it also has a uh, thousand IU's of natural vitamin E, which is very important for horses that are stressed because it helps the immune system. And we put um, some probiotics in there as well that will again help the digestive tract to process the feed better. So if you have a horse that you're really having a lot of trouble with, that's very skinny, or that you're working really hard, or a much older horse that's stressed due to illness. This product is a really nice product for that. So the two products for Kentucky, with Kentucky Performance Products are Equijoule and Endure Extra. If you're looking to put weight on your seniors, they're having trouble to keep keeping weight on. That's one way to do it. You can find all of Kentucky Performance Products at kppusa.com. And they have an excellent article over there, too, called Choosing Supplements for Senior Horses That Have Trouble Maintaining Weight. Next week, we'll be back talking about the ones who don't have any trouble maintaining weight and they're going into their senior years and maybe are getting a little too chunky. So we'll talk about those next week.
So, Philip, great show this week, and uh, I look forward to next week. And everyone can find our show notes and links to today's guests on our website at dressageradio.com. You can like us on Facebook. Just search for Dressage Radio Show. Follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio. My website is maplecrestfarmky.com, and my email is reese at horseradionetwork.com. You can find me at philipparksequestrian.com, and my email, I'd love to hear from you, is philip at horseradionetwork.com. So we'd like to thank our sponsors for this week, Equestrian Collections, Kentucky Performance Products, Draper Therapy, and Police Works. Don't forget to check out all our other shows on the horseradionetwork.com. And keep your heels down and your shoulders back. And we look forward to listening and being with you next week.